We, it's been a great, it's been a great session. We've, we've heard a lot about water, a lot about restoration, a lot about projects, a little about theory uh, even. And I think the goal of all of this is to actually um, put it on the ground and make it work, implement it, actually do some on the ground conservation. And as Nick just demonstrated, another goal is to follow those conservation projects through time and to see if they're successful, to see if they're working, to see if they're doing what we want them to do. Um, and SGI, what we're really interested in is doing both those, helping practitioners to target where they want to put restoration practices and then following those outcomes through time. And so we've built a few little tools that I'm going to demonstrate here uh, to, help us, to help us do that. Um, I drew the short end of the stick, and instead of showing a pretty picture of water and wet meadows and green grass, I am showing a server, server farm right here. But this is no ordinary server farm. This is a special server farm. This is a Google data center. Um, in this aisle is, it's about, I don't know, I don't know how long it is, 50 feet, maybe 70 feet long, 12 feet high. There are hundreds and hundreds of servers. In each one of those servers, there are many, many processors. In a data center, there are many, many aisles like this, up to hundreds of them in some of them. So we have thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of processors in these data centers. In these data centers, they're, they're scattered all across the globe. Um, there's quite a bit in North America, but there's big ones, there's small ones, they're all over the place. Now, what are these computers used for? So collectively, these are some of the most massive, most powerful computers that exist on the planet. Well, they're used for everything that Google does, actually. They're all pooled together. They're one big processing uh, servers, and they're used for YouTube. They're used for your Gmail. They're used for your Google Photos. When you upload your photos on your phone, they use these servers. They also, uh, Google uses them for all their cloud services as well. So imagine if you could just get 1%, maybe even less than 1%, a half a percent of the computational power available in all these data centers across the world and use them for management and for conservation. What would you, what would you do with it? So Google has allowed us to do that. Google has many cloud services, uh, many which um, are used for everyday production, web development, server, servers and things that, that are used for, for common day, everyday web things um, that you can use. And so we can utilize those. But Google has separated, they've created this thing called Google Earth Engine, which is a planetary um, platform for Earth observation and analysis. Basically, it's millions of processors that can be used to analyze satellite imagery. Not just satellite imagery, but any type of re remotely sensed imagery. So through the years, uh, we, we've been working, partnering with Google uh, to utilize these services to not only, to, well, to do a lot of research projects, to do a lot of science projects that can inform and help management and con con uh, uh, con um, conservation, but also to build spatial targeting tools and to evaluate outcomes. So um, one of these pro projects that we're working on that we're utilizing this a lot for, I'm going to give a plug here, is uh, Matt Jones this afternoon is giving a talk. And he has been util utilizing this um, to map continuous rangeland cover across the United States from the early 80s up until present day. So looking at annual forbs, perennial forbs, shrubs, continuous cover from 0 to 100%. So when you do that, you can look at it this way, but you can also look at it this way. You can combine all those things. And so you can merge all those things and you can get a bigger view of the landscape. So if there's one talk you need to see this afternoon, I believe it's in this room right next door here at 140. You can go see that Matt Jones. He's going to be talking about that. Oh, one of the things we can do with this is because it's through time, we can track changes in these plant functional groups through time going all the way back to the 80s. All of this is possible because of the processing power that we're leveraging. Okay, so going back to what we're using in terms of building tools for targeting uh, conservation and evaluating those outcomes. Because it's Google, it's built for the web. 
right? That's what they do. Their mission is to catalog the world's information and put it online. That's, 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 a, that's a great thing that they do. We can build web applications, we can build tools, websites that sit on the web that can harness all these power, all these processing processors in those servers and deliver it to users on the ground so they can use it for conservation. And so due to that, uh, we've built an interactive web application, map.sagegrassinitiative.com. You can pull it up on your phones or your iPads right now if you wanted, or when you get back to your computer, you can go there. It's also, if you go to the Sagegrass Initiative website, there's a direct link right there. But I'm going to be risky, and I'm going to click on it right now and hope that the internet works, and we're going to give you a little demo of what it does and, and, and how it works. Let's see. There we go. All right. So it's loading up. It loads up a, uh, like this. I'm going to zoom out here real quickly. So what it is, is in the background, um, I'm operating on a computer that's a little different from what I'm used to. So uh, I may make a few, uh, a few um, bumps, have a few bumps in the roads here. But what we have in the background is the normal Google Maps interface. And so as part of the Sage Grouse Initiative, we build a lot of data layers, a lot of data products. And many of those data products, not all, but many of them are spatially oriented. They're geospatial project, pro, uh, projects. And, and they're used to target conservation. And so what we're looking at right now is when you first load up the web application, it loads to this. This is relative abundance of a brewer sparrow. This is some layers, some data that we put on there not, not too long ago um, that shows the relative abundance of brewer sparrow that we were doing for a different project. But when you, when you load up uh, the web application, this is what it looks like. You got your Google Maps interface. You got these menus up here at the top. You got a wildlife tab and you got an ecosystem tab. And because, I'm, uh, because we're talking about mesic resources and this symposium is all about restoring these meso re or restoring or conserving these mesic resources, we're gonna highlight that specific layer uh, there right now. So if you click on it, it's gonna turn on the mesic resources layer. I'm gonna slide this down here. This right here controls the transparency of the layers. And I'm gonna zoom in on a specific area. This is a data set that Patrick Donnelly uh, was talking about earlier this morning. Now let's see if I can do this without, there we go. Gonna zoom in on, I'm gonna zoom in on an area here. So uh, if you remember, Patrick is talking about those ecological minimums. Um, because it's Google Maps, you can turn on the satellite imagery uh, b beneath and, and, and look and see what's available there. So Patrick uh, was talking about how these mesic resources, he gave a great example of how they structure and influence uh, LEX and how they, in wet years, they're plentiful, in dry years, um, they're not so plentiful. And so what we've done, this is uh, on, on this website, we've identified through an automated process 800,000 of these uh, mesic, mesic areas, mesic, mesic resources. And this is what you're looking at right now. And what we're specifically looking at is uh, the persistence of these mesic resources. If you remember, he said a mesic resource was productive it was, if it was above a certain NDVI threshold. So what we went through and went through all these polygons, and if it was never above that threshold in the 32 year time period, and it got a, it's a dark red, it's 0% productive. If it's 100% productive, it means it's above that threshold every single year. So what you can do is you can zoom into your area. This is an area in southwest Montana, uh, southwest of Dillon, Montana. And you can look at this and you can see on the landscape, I'll just zoom out a little bit. Turn that off. You can see those mesic resources. So immediately it can draw your eyes to where to work. Where do you want to go? You don't want to go to the red areas, right? Because they're turned off. They're never coming back. Or maybe you do. That might be part of your objective is to restore one of those. But where are you going to have the most success? And so this layer can key you in on those areas. So I'll zoom back in here. I'm going to turn this back on. What you can do is if you're interested, let's say we're interested in this area right here. You can click on that polygon and it's going to highlight it and if we're on a bigger screen, um, it looks like the, the bottom axis got messed up there, but that's, those are years through time. It gives you a graph of NDVI for that specific polygon. And you can see starting, it starts in 1984, and actually we just updated this the other day, and I'll talk about that in a second, and it goes all the way to 2017. But you can see early in the 80s, that specific polygon was productive. 
There was something going on there, something happening. So maybe there was some type of management. Maybe it had some good wet years in the 80s. But maybe as it went through time, maybe management changed. Maybe, maybe precipitation changed. You can see it wasn't as productive. But this is a tool that for the practitioner, they can go in there and get this information and help them decide, do I want to do a restoration here? Do I want to put in a beaver dam analog on this reach? Do I want to do some other type of restoration, change my grazing, as we saw with Maggie Creek? They can see that. They can get that information. You can highlight, if you actually want the specific numbers, you can highlight uh, on the graph, and it can give you the specific uh, NDVI values if, if that's what you're interested in. What you might be interested in is seeing how a particular year does. So I'm going to leave that polygon highlighted so you can see it, but I'm going to turn on this view specific years. Okay, and we have 2017 highlighted right now. So the other day we decided we were doing this symposium and we wanted to, to update this data set to 2017. So in less than a half a day, and actually less than two hours, I went through the entire uh, Landside arch archive again and I updated all the data for 2017. I basically remapped all these MESIC resources for the entire West in less than two hours. That's the, that's the computational power that we're dealing with here and how we can use this for conservation. So what we see is in 2017, it was a fairly decent year. You can also see the within polygon variation. What if you're interested in 2010? Not so bad. We can go back all the way to 1984. I think 92 was a, 92 was a little bit of a dry year. Maybe 95, I can't remember. There was one year in here that things were really dry and it got really brown. But you can see the individual year that you're interested in, because maybe you know some management happened at a specific year. So this is all information to help people make decisions. You can also look at multiple years. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the last five years. I'm going to zoom out so you can see a little bit of how the landscape. And you can see, you hit this play button, you can see a movie online. There's a little bit of delay due to the internet connection, but it'll catch up. So you can see how the landscape breathes. You can see when is it good, when is it bad. If I zoom out a little bit and go to eastern Montana, eastern Montana this year had an incredibly dry year. Turn off that so we can see. There we go. You can see that landscape change. And if you notice, when we get to 2017, it's going to become really brown. So again, these are tools that we're putting in the hands of practitioners. This is just a simple website. There's no software to download. There's nothing to sign in or log in. It's all publicly available. The last thing I want to demonstrate, I'll turn that off, is Going back to this, uh, this original layer of our MESIC resources, we know it, it was done through an automated process, right? Uh, no automated processes are perfect, and, and we absolutely know that, and we, we, we don't claim them to be perfect. Um, but we gave the ability for you to upload your own data and do your own analysis. And so first off, I'm going to do a demonstration here where you can draw on the map. So we're back to this area in southwest Montana that we were looking at before. And this, this right here was a polygon that I clicked on earlier. What you can do is you can click on custom analysis right here. I'm going to bring this down. And you can go in here and you can draw your own polygon. I'm going to highlight this little area right here. I'm just, I'm just going to draw one. You can draw more than one, but for this purposes, I'll just draw one. And you can hit calculate. And what it does is it goes out to our servers. It goes through that entire Landside archive in less than a second and brings back the information. And you can see, again, like that other polygon, this one's yellow, meaning it's in the, it's in the middle. And you can click on it, and you can see that trajectory through time, how NDVI has changed. And I, I should have said this earlier. This is specifically late season NDVI. This is um, that Patrick talked about ecological minimums. This is that, that time of the year when those minimums are actually doing something important. If, you have a, if you're dry at that time of the year, it has an ecological result, uh, both for the landscape but also for wildlife species. So you can do that. You can draw your own polygons. You can also upload a shape file. I'm going to hit reset here. You go in here, you can upload a zip shape file. I have an example here called Mesic's example. And it will zoom into the area of your shape file. 
This is, uh, this is the restoration that Jeremy highlighted in his talk uh, earlier. This is in, in, in Oregon. Um, a restoration that occurred in 2004 on this particular uh, creek. And so you can go in there and you can hit calculate. And again, it goes to our servers, it goes through that entire archive and gets us that history. And you can see, this is the graph that Jeremy showed before. You can see right here in 2004, after 2004, that, that line started increasing. It went up, the restoration worked. When Jeremy showed this to one of his coworkers, his coworker who worked on this project, he was ecstatic. He said, this is the best thing I have to show that we're actually making an impact on the ground. And so we've made this available so you can use this for, for, for any area, uh, more or less within the, within the sage grouse uh, range. And we can, we can see, are these practices working? Are the beaver, beaver dams that we're putting in, are they making an effect on the landscape? The grazing management that occurred at Maggie Creek, the, the analysis that, that Nick Silverman just uh, showed us, used a process, used this exact same process, and now an individual can do it on the web on their own. You don't have to reach out to, to the science arms, uh, the universities, the agencies, uh, to see if the work you're doing is having an impact. So that, that's, that's the power of, of that data center that I showed at the beginning. It, it's not as pretty as, as, the, as, the, as the wet meadow, as the riparian area, but the time is coming that we have the, we, we can do things now that we've been dreaming of for a long time. The computational power and storage has finally caught up to our, our ideas and we're able to do that. So uh, moving forward, the Sage Grouse Initiative has many, many projects uh, in which we're, we're doing these broad continental scale landscape level analyses we're also planning on building more and more of these dynamic web applications. Web applications where you provide the data, an analysis is run, and then you get a customized result for your specific project. Instant gratification, instant cons conservation gratification. Uh, it's gonna be good. So that's, that's the end of my talk. I, I thank you all for participating, for coming to this session. Uh, it's been a wonderful time. Again, all, all of the talks are going to be archived and put online within two weeks. You can go to the um, Sage Grouse Initiative uh, website to get those, get those talks and to get those links. Um, I'll make a brief announcement and then uh, I'll take questions and we can break for lunch. Uh, there's going to be about a two hour break here. Uh, we're going to return at 1.30 to resume this session and, and talk more about um, mesic areas and restoration. Thank you. Okay, two questions. Sir, you in the yellow shirt, and then Lance. It, it, it doesn't mess up the data, but this is where the, so the, the question is, uh, this individual um, lives southwest of Dillon and has seen, has seen the areas that I demonstrated on the web application and asked if, if flood irrigation messes up the data. It doesn't mess up the, does not mess up the data, but we definitely pick up on that. And, and the key here is, again, the local knowledge is absolutely essential. We're not making any recommendations from these big, broad-scale analyses. We're just providing the tools for practitioners and users. They can go in and see the history. And if, if an individual knows that, they can, they can judge accordingly and make their decisions accordingly. Uh, we're not trying to do a top-down approach here. We're just trying to empower people so they can make uh, the, the best, the most correct decision. Yes. The analysis. So, 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 so the question is if um, if we can control or um, manipulate or account for the resolution uh, within these analyses, and it, and if we can get it for other scientific applications. Um, so you are correct, it is, this is, does use Landsat data, so it's, it's 30 meters uh, resolution, medium resolution, it's about the size of a baseball diamond. Um, 
we, we, we obviously can't go finer uh, than that with this specific data set. With other data sets, uh, we can. We can go coarser, though I'm not sure we would, we would want to do that in this particular case. Um, so we can control the resolution of what the analysis is, is um, applied. The second question of getting, prod, uh, getting data out, um, you know, the sky's the limit to what we can do and what we can build. Um, I should put a plug in, the, the individual who built this web app for us, Jeremy Malzik, a uh, good friend of mine, and, and, a, and a web app developer. Um, we can do lots of things uh, with this. And so if we wanted to build an application where you can download this data or this shapefile and use it in an analysis, yes, we can do that. It's not currently set up to do that. We do have another um, tool on the web, our fence collision layer uh, tool, in which you can do that. You can, you can upload some LEC data and it'll calculate the fence collision risk for those LECs, and then you can download uh, raster imagery to be used in your planning projects uh, for your specific you know, conservation projects. Um, so as we move forward, I think we're going to see more and more of this, uh, where this, we have this customized data approach, where it's kind of bring your own data or customize the data to fit your needs, as opposed to a static approach where it's one size fits all. One last question. So we, we work, for this specific layer, we work uh, particularly at the pixel level. And so we only gr uh, grab cloud-free pixels. Um, and it is actually the average of late season in UVI for this uh, particular uh, data set from July 15th to September 30th. So it's an average across that late season. Um, we won't be changing this data set for, for you know, other, other particular needs, but yes, it's possible to pick out particular dates or to go even finer than, you know, three months. Thank you very much. We'll break for lunch.